This evening as we uh, come before a holy God, listen to these words from Psalm 107. Put them in relationship to people that you know in your own life where we encounter trials, tribulations, we come across uneasy seas, so to speak, in the boat of life. Listen to these words. For he, God, spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens and went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord with their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still, so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he, God, guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes in this moment as we go to a holy God in prayer. Holy God, we do come to you this evening with our prayers and our requests. We, your family members, look upon you for help, for renewal in all of our circumstances. This evening, we have brought together prayer requests for those with cancer, for our own church staff. We also come to you for many requests of salvation, so many of them in need. We also pray for Easter at Coolidge, one prayer request for a young person contemplating suicide, for marriages, for someone in jail, for a safe pregnancy, and you heard many several unspoken requests. And then the continuing request for those in Ukraine, that peace would prevail, that the hungry would eat and the wounded would be healed. Many praises for you, Lord, in these requests this evening and for our troops overseas for their protection. So, holy God, we put these requests before you and ask for answers. Ask to be taken out of the stormy sea and brought to our desired haven. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, good evening. And uh, we are about to start the Reformation. So I thought I would dress up in my 16th century costume. Actually, this is a, uh, a pastor's standard robe. And uh, you'll have to look at me this way for the rest of the evening, kind of in costume. If you would, uh, did all of you get the additional handout that was up there? It's just a single sheet. Let me just uh, ask a couple questions and then we'll get into the main uh, portion of the session. Uh, there are a couple questions down here. Uh, what in the Reformation movement found ground in the future Baptist movement? And these are some questions that I want you to ponder on for the next uh, probably 50 minutes plus. Uh, the first one is reference baptism. How did the Reformation change the way that we observe baptism? Uh, number two, the formation and practice of the Lord's Supper was impacted during the Reformation. And the way that we practice it today comes directly out of the Reformation period. The understanding of salvation by faith and grace. Where did that come from? That comes out of the Reformation. The nature of independent churches rather than churches re, uh, reporting to some hierarchy, some higher authority. That comes out of the Reformation. Also, the, the work of the Holy Spirit through the individual. Something that really wasn't known or understood or the theology wasn't developed until we get into this Reformation period. And that's so important for us to understand that. So when we look at those questions this evening, we need to ask the question, you need to ask the question as we go through this, what does all of this say to you about the Reformation and who we are as a church, as a denomination today? 
Well, we're going to be looking at that, and if you would, uh, turn to page one on your handout, and uh, we're going to be looking first at these uh, individuals uh, in the church, and uh, they are all important characters, and uh, what we're going to do is try to identify who they are uh, through this evening. And uh, you'll find out that they all kind of dress alike. They, they all seem to like to have Tams, these little hats up here. This seems to be something that they were all into. Uh, of course, uh, the three individuals across the top are directly involved in the Reformation as the individual on the far... Uh, whoops. Okay, we went too far ahead there. Okay. Uh, the individual on the far left... He was involved, but these two individuals are kind of in a separate category. But before we identify these individuals, look down at your handout. Uh, in Roman numeral 2 down there, the Reformation of the Church of Jesus the Christ. Here's a question. Uh, what were some of the problems that we have talked about uh, with the refor pre-Reformation? What was going on in the church in the East and the church in the West that push some of these reformers to actually look at the church and say, we need to change. We need to reform the church into what Jesus originally intended it to be. So we asked that question. We've, we've looked at some of those features today, and many of them uh, fall in line with the questions I just asked in the past couple minutes. But here's the question for you. What are some of the problems that we have in the church today? What are some of the problems that we have in the church today? Uh, what are some of the issues that uh, come up or plague the church or uh, cause denominations uh, to split? What are some of those issues that are ongoing today uh, that we, we find in the church? What, what are some of them? Somebody shout out something that they know has been a problem in a church. Anybody in here ever been in a church that split? Okay. Anybody in here ever been a church where they had some disagreements, some serious disagreements about theology? Yeah. Well, those were some of the issues that were going on in the church in the 14th and 15th century. Some of those. Staffing problems. Okay. Uh, sometimes you come in and uh, don't raise your hand with this one. Have you ever been in a church where you said, I don't like the sermons? Okay, don't, don't raise your hands, okay? <laughs> uh, so those things do happen, and, and some of those um, messages in a different form occurred back pre-Reformation. Uh, so at the time of the Reformation, we still had the two, as I call them, the two big dogs, the church in the West, which eventually became the Roman Catholic Church, and the church in the East, which we know became the Orthodox Church and that whole family of Orthodox churches. And in the south of the Mediterranean, we had several other churches, large churches that were actually starting to grow. Uh, they were the Coptic churches. Now, some of you may, way back in your memory, recall about nine months ago when Gary was preaching, I don't remember which campus it was, I think it was Saudi Daisy, and he mentioned the Coptic church. And I bet you most people went like, well, what's the Coptic church? Well, it was one of the first original Christian churches in the, the east or in the Mediterranean area. So there were many churches beyond those two ones that I said and mentioned earlier. Well, look down uh, at uh, Roman numeral 2b. Uh, one of the problems that was plaguing at the church at this time was justifi justification by faith versus church tradition. Church tradition. Uh, or as we have talked about in the past couple of weeks uh, in the church in the West, uh, canon law. Canon law or the dogma or the teaching of the church in Rome. And just to cut to the chase... Uh, that dogma or those teachings that were coming out of the church in Rome surpassed, were above what the people knew was in Scripture. Can you imagine that? That what they were saying was the law of the church was more important than what was in the Bible. It usurped what was in the Bible. And, and many of these reformers that we have up here were starting to say, Ah, that dog don't hunt. 
Well, maybe they didn't say it that way. They said something like, I disagree with that. Uh, and they were probably talking amongst one another. They hadn't run that up the chain of command yet to Rome, but they were talking about it. And it was an issue, and they wanted to actually uh, address it and maybe reform that position. Uh, also in the, the Roman Catholic Church, and for that matter, the church in the East, they had what were called sacraments. Sacraments comes from the Latin word sacramentum, sacramentum, uh, which was something you paid something for. It was a kind of a secular term. You paid money for something. And those sacraments were the seven ways that you could be saved. So there was kind of like church law that said in order for you to be saved, you had to be baptized. Uh, actually, marriage was a sacrament. Uh, last rites, extreme unction, putting on oil was another sacrament. They had seven of them where they told their parishioners, if you want to be saved, you have to come to the Eucharist, come to the Mass every week. And as you're leaving, make sure you drop something in the, the bucket. Okay, and, and if you want to be forgiven of the sins that you committed in the past week, you go confess that to a priest, and then the priest will intercede and then say, drop something in the bucket, please. Okay, uh, they called those indulgences, indulgences. And many of these reformers said, no, wait a second. You shouldn't have to pay uh, to have your sins forgiven. You know, Christ died on the cross. They were just starting to formulate these things. And it was very important that uh, we understand that. So what was going on at the time of the Reformation? Well, the Renaissance was in full swing. Things were starting to happen down in Italy and France. And there was new science and new writing and new paintings, new art, things as such. Uh, the Crusades had ended over 100 years previous. So that was kind of past history. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire was ongoing. They were still very powerful. And remember, that was kind of a jointure between the church and the state. They were, so to, so to speak, inextricably tied together. They were like one and the same. And these reformers were saying what? We need to divide the two of them. The church is one entity and the state is another entity. So that was going on. Uh, Central Europe, Northern Italy, Eastern France were all part of that Holy Roman Empire. Uh, Leo X was a sitting pope in Rome. Uh, he was at that time just building St. Uh, Peter's Cathedral. And it took them several hundred years to build some of these cathedrals and basilicas that were out there. So what are the problems we just talked about? Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower... I have two kinds of problems, the urgent and the important. The urgent are not important, and the important are never urgent. Now, doesn't that sound like our government today? Well, when I ran across this quote, I said, I like that. I, I like that. Nothing, nothing seems to be really urgent. And probably when some of these Catholic priests wanted to reform the church, they would go to their local bishop or somebody like that, and they'd say, well, that's not really urgent. You know, that's not really important, or I think that's a misunderstanding on your part. Okay, problems and issues in the church in Rome. Main characters, who is that? What's your guess? That's Martin Luther, okay? That's Martin Luther. That was before he went on the uh, all-protein diet. Okay, uh, and you, you can just follow along in your handout here at this point. Uh, Martin Luther uh, was born in Eisleben, uh, Germany. Those are his dates of birth and death. So he's right in the middle of that time of, of the Reformation. Uh, led the Reformation in Germany. Okay, he was the main character in, in Germany. All right, let me go back there for a second. There are a couple of things on your handout there I wanted to talk about. Uh, down on your handout when we talk about uh, Martin Luther, uh, he was a professor of theology at Wittenberg. Uh, he was a composer of music. He was also a Roman Catholic priest. Okay, so he's in the church. He's in the church and he sees a need 
for these reforms. And, and one of the reforms that he was seemingly very focused on was uh, people were buying priest positions. They would just come in and they'd have a lot of money and they would pay the church and just become a priest rather than going through some type of vetting process and it was an actual call to the ministry and study. Instead, they would just buy these priestly positions. Uh, eventually, he married uh, Katharina von Bora, who happened to have been a nun. Now, this is after the Reformation. <laughs> he, he didn't get married while he was still in the church as a priest. After he was defrocked and thrown out of the, the church, he did marry her. They had several, several children. And as noted down here, and as we talked about several weeks ago, he translated the Bible into standard German vernacular, kind of like the lingua franca or the, the language in Germany at that time. He did that. Uh, one of the first individuals to translate the whole Bible through a local language. The key verse, key verse, and you've got it down there, Ephesians 2.8. We've all heard that passage. It talks about how you are saved. And it's not something you do. It's the work of Christ on the cross. And here's the thing about uh, Martin Luther. We, we talked about how he was a law student. He was in law class to become an attorney. Uh, his father wanted him to be there. And if you remember the story I told you, he was on his way to visit some people. He was on his horse. He was going through a, uh, a forest, and there was a big thunderstorm, and a lightning bolt hit right beside his horse and threw him off the horse. And at that moment, he had an epiphany. There was just this awareness, a new awareness in his life, and he dropped out of law school and went to seminary to become a priest, okay? But yet there's a lot of anecdotal information that talks about they believe that he suffered from mild depression, that he suffered from mild depression, and, and that was exacerbated. It was made worse by his sense of that he could never be forgiven for his sins, that there was nothing he could do to alleviate this pain of, I'm a sinner in front of God. I can't, I can't give enough money. I can't uh, fondle enough rosary beads. Uh, I can't confess enough. I, I can't do enough good work. And, and years, years later, he stumbled once again on Ephesians 2.8. And he pondered on it, and he prayed about it, and he said, you know, it's, it's not about what I do. It's about what he did on the cross. Boy, that was a seminal moment in the history of Christianity, because suddenly it was grace by faith and not grace by doing something. So that's very important. Um, now, down there in uh, number seven, the 95 thesis on the uh, Wittenberg Castle door, church door. Uh, many people attribute to him uh, this thesis, kind of like his uh, statement of new faith and understanding, that he hammered it up on the door in Wittenberg, uh, where in fact there's more historical information to say that some of his students sitting in class, taking notes, and he passes this out to them, and they go like, doggone, man, you got to give this to the world. You know, everybody's got to see this. And they just picked it up, and they went down, and they tacked it on the door. Surprise, surprise. Well, when the, the nobles and when the other church officials saw this, they considered it to be heresy, absolute crazy heresy. Something has to be done with this. And, of course, what they did, if you look down here, they issued a papal bull, and essentially, a bull was a uh, kind of a warrant for his arrest from the church. It was a demand for him to come before a board and, and explain what he meant by all these heretical or crazy ideas. And they went beyond just the, the uh, faith by grace or grace by faith. Uh, it was a whole lot of other things that were in this 95 the thesis. So this papal bull essentially said, anyone out there, Bring him here. Bring him here. However you need to do it, bring him in front of us here at the church, and we're going to try him. But he was admired by a couple, um, I guess you would call them kind of like little, little mayors of little cities around in Germany. Uh, and one in the area of Saxony actually said, you come to my castle, I'll protect you. 
And so he kind of camped out there for a while. But eventually he did uh, come to trial and he was uh, defrocked. He never would recount. He, he never did recant his, what he, his statement was. And so he was thrown out. Now, here's an important point you want to remember. So he comes to trial and he has a lot of followers, citizenry, congregants. We're saying, you know, he's right. He's got a couple points here that make a whole lot of sense. And so they're trying him, and uh, who knows what they were going to do, jail him or torture him or whatever. But a large group of the citizenry came out to protest what they were doing to him. Well, that group of people that came out to protest were eventually called the Protestants, the Protestants, okay, as we say it today. So that's where the term Protestant comes from. They came out, and so... It, and and. Luther still didn't want to break from the church. He wanted to reform the church. He believed in the church. But eventually it all gathered together and he established what we now call the what church? The Lutheran church, okay. And of course there are several different types of Lutheran churches out there which we might catch up with here in a couple weeks. Okay, look down at your handout. And uh, another individual that we have, main character, okay, John Calvin. John Calvin. Uh, and, and this is not the John Calvin of the Santa Claus. You never watched that movie? Okay, the Santa Claus. Okay, all right. Okay, we'll move on. All right. <laughs> now, uh, John Calvin, born in northern France. Uh, there's his date of birth. Uh, not, he was also an attorney. Well, all these attorneys that have these epiphanies and all of a sudden become church pastors and, and theologians. Uh, he led the Reformation in France. And once again, uh, his, uh, his parents, his father in particular, wanted him to be an attorney. Now, he had a pension for theology before he even went to law school. He just really enjoyed theology. Uh, they were part of the, the church in Rome. And, uh, and yet, at a certain point, he too said, you know, I, I need to become a priest. And so he eventually became a priest in the church. But he also was led to desiring to reform the church. And uh, one, one last comment about him. Uh, he, uh, he wrote prolifically. Uh, and a lot of his works are now found in the basis for the Reformed Church and the Reformed Churches here in America. It's, it's overseas. And also in the Presbyterian Church. Those are the two churches that he has had the most impact on. Uh, and he wrote prolifically. Uh, if you would Google his uh, name or go on Amazon writings by John Calvin, you know, he, he just wrote, and it's brilliant stuff. I, he was probably one of the geniuses of his time. Okay, let's uh, move on now to John, John Knox. Okay, uh, John Knox is an individual that comes out of uh, Scotland. Uh, he was actually born uh, in England itself. Uh, he kind of was later into the Reformation period. Many had come before him. So uh, he had the added value of being able to read the works of some of the other people, whether it was Luther or Calvin, uh, either one of them. Uh, as I said, he led the Reformation in Scotland. And if you know anything about John, uh, John Knox, uh, he established the Presbyterian Church, okay? He established the Presbyterian Church. He was originally a, a, a priest in the Catholic Church, and then he was also a, uh, uh, I guess you would call it a priest in the Church of England, okay? And he has kind of an interesting background because at one point, uh, the church went from being Roman Catholic in England, and then we have Henry VIII, and then it goes to become the Church of England, and then as they switched kings and queens, it went back to the Roman Catholic Church, and he kind of got caught in the middle of all this, uh, and eventually was uh, exiled uh, to Switzerland, uh, where he actually studied with some of the other reformers and had an opportunity. Uh, one of the main things that uh, he did in terms of uh, the church uh, was the polity. 
or church organization. And as I mentioned some weeks ago, uh, he established the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church comes from the word, Greek word, presbyteros, presbyteros, which literally translates into English, elder, elder. That's where the, uh, the Greek word uh, presbyteros is translated into English. And of course, if you know Presbyterian form of government or their polity, as it would be, that is an elder form of government. Uh, they have elders that run the church, and they have a presbytery that they report to. And that was one of the things that uh, Knox pulled out of Scripture. And depending on what translation you have, sometimes you'll actually hear and see the word elder or presbyteros uh, in the Bible. So that was his uh, uh, main uh, attribute. Okay. Oh, okay. Here we have Ulrich Zwingli. Okay, uh, you'll have to pronounce that later on. Ulrich Zwingli. That's a real tongue twister. Uh, he was born in Wildhaus, uh, Auf der Schweiz, in the Switzerland. Uh, once again, he was kind of like right in the middle of all of this. Led the Reformation in Switzerland. Uh, and Switzerland uh, eventually uh, came to war with the Holy Roman Empire, which I find fascinating, and he was killed in one of the battles there. Let me go back to him for just a second. Um, down on your handout under D, uh, one of the uh, interesting things about him is he introduced fasting during Lent. And we are in the Lenten period right now, uh, which is a time where the more liturgical churches, and we're not a liturgical church, that's Lutheran, Episcopal, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, uh, they enter into Lent before Easter, and it's a time of repentance, reflection, so on and so forth. And uh, that's not a bad idea for any one of us occasionally to just kind of sit down and kind of reflect on where you are in your life and what you're doing and are you doing the right things uh, and just uh, contemplating, uh, meditating on the Lord's Word. That's really pretty good. We typically don't uh, do that in, in our uh, denomination. Uh, also down there, he was a Roman Catholic uh, priest. Uh, he, like some of the other reformers, believed in clerical marriages. Okay, now at this time, uh, both the church in the East and the church in West said, nah, that's a no-go. You know, we, we believe that Scripture tells us that you need to be focused uh, and you need to be celibate so that you can focus all your energy and time on God. Okay, well, some, for some that worked. For these guys, they went, eh, I don't think so. Okay, And most of them after the Reformation, most of them after they were excommunicated, got married, had kids, you know, had families very successfully. Uh, down in uh, Roman numeral sub four down there, developed early confessions in the church. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, the difference between confessions and creeds. Uh, creeds are like the Apostles' uh, Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. We've all heard the Apostles' Creed. The Nicene Creed that we mentioned is, is longer and more detailed. But he went from a creed, which is kind of a form of what you believe, an easy way to memorize that this is what I believe as a Christian, to a form called confessions where you would come into church and you would say, I confess this, okay? And it's written down. And if you couldn't confess that, then you couldn't be a member of the church. It was, it was that simple. Now, we as Baptists are not creedal. We are not confessional. We're neither one. Now, you can look at them, the Nicene Creed and some of the, con the Ausberg Confession or some of the newer ones, and you could say, well, yeah, I, yeah, I'm okay with that. But we believe your relationship to God through Christ is between you and Christ, okay? And you confess it on that basis. Now, I told you in the last class, I'm going to pass out the Baptist faith and message, which is kind of a guideline. It, it kind of tells you where we are as, as a group of people. 
And as we go through those very quickly on the last class, you'll say either, I believe that, I agree with that, or thirdly, you'll say, I didn't know that. But boy, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And I understand that now. So that's good. Okay, so that was him, uh, creeds and confessions. Okay, and then uh, down in five, he developed and practiced the Lord's Supper as we know it today. He's the guy that actually developed what we call the memorial form of the Lord's Supper. Now, as I have mentioned before, originally in the church in the West and the church in the East, when they performed the Lord's Supper, they call it the Eucharist, which in Latin, Eucharistio, means to give thanks. And yeah, when, when you're doing the Lord's Supper, you give thanks. Thank you for what you did, Lord. Your body, your blood, the sacrifice. Well, what he looked at it uh, differently than the church in the West, where in the church in the West, they believed in what's called transubstantiation. And that's the form where you, you take the Eucharist, you come in and you take the bread, and that literally becomes the body of Christ. And then you take the wine or juice or whatever they're serving, and that literally becomes the blood of Christ. These reformers, and in particular Zwingli, he said, I don't think that's the way it works. Well, just look at the scripture. It says, and as often as you do this, do this in what? Remember it to me. Yeah, you hear that once a month. And these guys, in particular Zwingli, said, oh, yeah, okay, we'll do it this way. We'll have a memorial. It'll remind you. And before we do it, we'll pray. We'll pray and we'll confess our sins, come clean to the altar, and do a memorial form of it. So the church in the West and the East believed in transubstantiation. We moved to Luther, and Luther believed in what was called consubstantiation, consubstantiation. Now, what do all these terms mean, Phil? Well, consubstantiation moves from the literal form of the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist to something in the middle where you know, Luther believed, well, you know, Christ is kind of in it and he's around it and he's before it and he's after it, he's part of it. He's not literally it, but can you see the subtle, subtle difference there? between the two. It was very subtle. And so in his movement, they went to consubstantiation, which there are in that certain salvific effects. Okay, When, when you go into a church and you see, oh, we're going to celebrate the Eucharist, they tend to believe that that's a methodology of salvation. Okay, Now, if you see the Lord's Supper, then you know it's a memorial form. So, they, so we have the church in the West and the East, then you have Luther, and then you have Zwingli, but in between that, you've got Calvin. And John Calvin said, now wait a second, they haven't reformed enough. Can you see these guys? You know, Luther said, I'm going re to reform the, the, the Lord's Supper. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, Luther comes in and says, I'm going to reform it. And then you have Calvin that says, well, I'm going to reform it more. Uh, from what Luther did. And, and then, you, then you have an, another person that comes in and says, well, I'm going to even reform it more than that. And Calvin took a different position. He said, when you take the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, it gives you, listen to this, he said, a foretaste of the future in heaven. Wow, that's, I, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I feel that when I'm taking the Lord's Supper. I remember what he did for me and everything, but I don't have this kind of, ex I'm sorry, existential, we've been using that word lately, yeah, this existential experience of being in heaven, but that was kind of the form that he said, that's, that's what the Lord's Supper did, so they kept reforming and reforming and reforming, okay, let's see who else is coming up here, okay, ah, uh, now who is that? Man, I'll tell you what, look at those, uh, shoulder pads that he's got on. He's, he's probably about 110 pounds, but he looks like he's probably about 160. That's Henry VIII. There he is. What's that song? <laughs> That'll be stuck in your head for the rest of the night. <laughs> You'll go to sleep and say, ah, I 
hated that. <laughs> okay, yeah, born in Kent, England. Uh, there's his uh, date of birth and uh, death. You know, his, his, last, his last wife outlived him. Isn't that kind of ironic? He was married six times, but his last wife outlived him. Now his second wife lost her head over him, if, if you know what I mean. Okay, uh, formed the Anglican Church, also known as the Church of England. Uh, look down on your hand out there, married six times, Catherine of Aragon. Uh, he wanted to uh, annul the wedding, and he wanted to get out of it and everything, and so he goes to the Pope and says, you know, hey, I need your papal disposition, and the Pope says, no, this isn't going to work, you're married. He goes, well, then I'll just start my own church, na 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 you know, and so he breaks away from the church in, in Rome and, and starts the Church of England, and of course, who becomes the head of the church in England but... Henry VIII, yeah, Henry VIII becomes the, the head of the church. And, uh, and did he allow himself to be divorced or annulled? Of course he did. <laughs> we'll sign that today. And that happened around 1530-ish. Uh, I don't know that they have an exact date, uh, somewhere around that time. Uh, once again, down on your handout, uh, his second wife executed Anne Boleyn. Uh, his third wife was... Anybody want to guess? Jane Seymour. How can you forget that name? Jane Seymour was his third wife. Not, not the Jane Seymour, but, you know, another. <laughs> Unless it was the Jane Seymour, how many of you have seen the, the movie Somewhere in Time? There you go. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it was her. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, a couple interesting things about him. Uh, he was the guy that authorized what was called the Great Bible. The Great Bible. It was an English translation. We talked about it. Uh, it was, uh, they brought together all the oldest manuscripts and said, translate this into, and it was Middle English. So for us to read the Great Bible today would be kind of challenging. Uh, it would be very challenging, as a matter of fact. Um, that was done in 1539. Uh, Miles Coverdale had a lot to do with that, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but here's the important point. The reason that Henry VIII wanted this translation was so it would be read in church. Now, isn't that a novel idea? You come to church and somebody reads the Bible. Well, before this time, that was not the standard form. They didn't read the Bible in church. Uh, the priest may uh, reference the Bible, uh, may even use something in a homily or kind of a short message, but they didn't read Scripture. Uh, how many of you go to the Saudi campus? Okay. Um, and, and what did Patrick do? He read through the whole passage, the 103rd Psalm, read through the whole thing. Wow. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. What a, what a nice reading that was. Uh, so it was to be read aloud. Uh, now, here is a little confusing point for some people. There were two parallel reformations going on at this time. You had Luther and his group were charting out this way, okay, the Lutheran church and then the Presbyterian church, so on and so forth. But then on the other side, you had Henry VIII breaks away from the Roman Catholic Church, and he is really kind of doing a kind of what I would call an oddball reformation, okay? He's just kind of like, well, I'm going to take my ball and go home. But the key to this is, is that him breaking away from the church in, uh, in Rome actually led to a true reformation on that side. And many historians call that the English Reformation. I mean, there was the, the Reformation that was led by Martin Luther, true, and we'll, we'll be looking at that in the next couple of weeks. But over here on this side, we have the English Reformation. And that caused many of the denominations that we'll be talking about in just, uh, just a minute here. Uh, and also, one last footnote about him. He was the father of the British Navy. He established the British Navy. Kind of okay. Okay. All right. King James I. Okay. King James Version of the Bible. This is the guy right here, okay? Uh, also known as King James VI of Scotland before he came, became King James I of all of uh, England. Uh, picture, okay, King James. 
It, this is not King James. That's James LeBron. Okay, different guy. Uh, okay. Um, one of the interesting features during this time was uh, Mary I, Queen of England, also known as Bloody Mary. Uh, she was uh, the individual that actually, after uh, Henry broke away, then she brought it back to the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, So there was a period over a number of years where the uh, people in England didn't know whether they were part of the church England, the Anglican church, or they were part of the Roman Catholic church. They were kind of going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, her father was Henry VIII, so she went a different direction, uh, fought to return England to the Catholic roots, failed, but burned at the stake 280 dissenters. Uh, once again, we go back to this whole notion, like John Wycliffe, we don't like you, we'll dig your bones up and we'll burn them. You know, the, the church can be very brutal at any given time. And there is sweet Mary uh, herself. Okay, uh, main characters, there's uh, James, uh, the fourth, and then eventually the first, born in uh, Scotland, uh, time, okay. Um, and if you look down on your hand out there, uh, he unionized uh, Scotland and England, uh, the King James Bible, the authorized version. He's the guy that kind of got that whole event uh, going. And uh, an important point to remember is that that King James Version uh, of the Bible was preceded by other English translations like the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible. All of those were in English before the King James Version. Um, it was translated between 1604 and 1611. We talked about that by the uh, Hampton Court. Uh, now, what was it that uh, premeditated or preceded the development of the King James Version? Well, there was a new group uh, that was coming out of the Church of England. I told you how each reformer wanted to reform the church more and more and more. Well, one group that formed in the Church of England were called the Puritans. And the Puritans, although they were kind of mainstream Church of England, England people, uh, they wanted to reform the church even more. A matter of fact, what they wanted to do was, quote, unquote, purify the church. They wanted to purify the church, and they, thus they picked up the name the Puritans. And they gained in numbers, and they had a lot of politicians that became Puritans. And th that large group came to the king and came to the parliament and said, you know, we really want to reform the church, and we also want to kind of update the Bible. And so this is when King James said, okay, let's get the Hampton Court together, all the bishops and all the, uh, the theologians and everything, and let's retranslate, let's develop a new version of the Bible. And what came out of that? The King James Version, okay, of the Bible. So the Puritans had a lot uh, to do with that. Um, the one curious thing about the uh, King James, the original version, included the apocryphal books, you remember those, the apocryphal books? Uh, those were the one from the Old Testament that were not, they're not canon in, in our Bible, uh, but many of them were looked at as non-heretical, the, the book of 1st, 2nd, 3rd Maccabees, and the, the, Bi the book of Baruch, uh, which was written by Jeremiah Scribe. They included that in the original version of it. Uh, it's not in there today. Uh, and, of course, uh, that's probably the most widely printed book in the history of the world, the King James Version of the Bible. Okay, uh, other groups in the Reformation. At the same time that the Reformation was going on, uh, there was another group that was saying, we need to reform it even more. <laughs> it wasn't enough that they'd reformed it, but they wanted to reform the church even more. And this was called the Radical Reformation, the Radical Reformation. Uh, how far to reform? That was the question. Uh, that was when we find the Anabaptists, the Anabaptists. Uh, and they were kind of in uh, uh, North Central Europe, kind of Northern Germany, Netherlands, you know, in that, that area up in there. Uh, the word Anabaptist really doesn't tell us a whole lot about Baptists today. But Anabaptist in the original languages means rebaptize. That's what it literally means in the older languages, rebaptize or baptize again. Now, up until this time, 
the church was fundamentally a pedo-baptist organization. You're born, you're baptized. Well, why? Well, you're, you're born a sinner, so let's baptize you. That's one of the sacraments. We'll pull you out, and okay, you're, you're free. You know, you're sinless now. But, you know, we, we keep having to resave you and resave you. And, and so they believed, no, what we believe is in reading Scripture, it's something that Christ does, and it's something that you have to have the knowledge of good and bad and the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, okay? The knowledge, the, the point of accountability when a child grows up, okay? And, and, and so they said, well, you know, there are a lot of us in this group that were baptized as children, but now we really understand what Christ did on the cross. We're going to rebaptize you, okay? And uh, we're, we're going to rebaptize you, and then you'll be saved. And they were called the Anabaptists. Uh, many Baptists believe that the Anabaptists are the uh, main thread of the Baptist family. Not really. They have a piece of it. They have a piece of it. They have that understanding of baptism at that point of accountability in someone's life. They, they got that piece correctly. Okay, let's go on with this. Uh, they were an anti-hate group. Uh, there's kind of the area uh, that they were very strong. Uh, most of that is in uh, the Germany, the area of Germany. And later on, next week, we're going to see how some uh, uh, parishioners, some leaders of the church in uh, England eventually are kind of become outcasts, and they send them over here. They wind up in the Netherlands area, what we call Netherlands today. And uh, over there, they go like, ah, baptism. We understand what baptism is really about. It's not being baptized as an infant. It's being baptized when you understand your relationship with God through Christ. Okay? Uh, some of the outcomes of the early Reformation, uh, grace by faith, solo scriptura. Early on in the church, it was scriptura suprema. Scripture is supreme, but it's not the top. Martin Luther and all these reformers said, no, Scripture is it. We're based upon the Scripture. We live by the Scripture. We die by the Scriptures. And, and it's not about the church canon law. It's not about the church dogma, some priest telling you. No, it's about Scripture. And all these reformers were solid on that. Uh, the different forms of church polity and organization. Uh, when we look at the churches uh, moving into the Reformation, uh, we find three primary types of organization or polity uh, in a church. Um, one is the uh, bishop form of government. Okay, that's where there's a, a bishop. Uh, you know, as I've told you before, I came out of the Methodist church, you know, probably 60 plus years ago, uh, and they had a bishop. And the bishop told the local ministers what to do, and here's your money, and uh, we're moving you over here and there, okay? Now, bishop uh, comes from an early Greek word, episkipos, episkipos. That's where bishop comes from. And, of course, what church is named for a bishop form of government but the, the Episcopals? Yeah. But, of course, uh, Roman Catholics, uh, Orthodox churches, and Lutherans uh, typically have a bishop, a bishop form of, of government. Uh, the other, one of the other forms of government uh, is that the elder form, and we just talked about that, the elder form, and that was where you have elders that run the church. Okay? Uh, the pastor reports to the board of elders. So you have the elder form, you have the bishop form, and then you have what's called the congregational form of church government and operation. Now, what form of government are Baptists? Congregational. That's right. I, I call it the democracy of church operations. You know, we vote on things. You have meetings. You, you express your opinion on things. Okay? All right? So th those things come out of the Reformation. Uh, a move away from stuff. 
I kind of say that tongue-in-cheek because uh, up until the time of the Reformation, uh, you had these operations where the, the priests would be wearing their miters and all those really fancy-looking dress and everything, and they would come in, you know, and people would, you know, bow to them, and, you know, there, there was all this pomp and circumstance. They had statues and, and paintings, and they would venerate they would recognize with, with great authority uh, these statues and paintings, you know, who these people were, the, the Virgin Mary and, and so on and say, so forth. Uh, these reformers said, uh, set all that stuff aside. We're here to worship and exalt the Savior, Jesus Christ. End story. End story. And a lot of people, once they understood that and had access through initially Gutenberg Press, read it in the Scripture, folks. Read it in the scripture. Solo scriptura. Solo scriptura. Uh, independent churches come out of, you know, this, this movement. So important because before there was like organizations. And, of course, in organizations, you, you drop money in, in the, the till here or the bucket here, and part of that goes local, and then part of it goes where? Up the chain of command. And that's still the way that the uh, many churches operate today. We don't. When, when money leaves this church, where does it go? It goes to the, the food pantry. That's our decision. It, it goes to, you know, some other charity that's determined. It goes to individuals that we determine where it's going. We make that determination where the money's going. It doesn't go to some hierarchical uh, group that's, that's out there. Okay. All right. Baptism. Uh, on your first uh, single sheet that I passed out to you. Baptism uh, comes out of the Anabaptist and the Age of Accountability. The Anabaptists had that right. They brought that into the Reformation. That was a piece that we as Baptists eventually incorporated into our faith. Uh, formation and practice of the Lord's Supper, that comes out of the, uh, uh, the Calvinists and, and also Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli. Salvation by faith and grace. That was Martin Luther and the Lutheran movement. Independent churches, the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists didn't want to have any part with government or any organizations. They said independence. The churches should be independent and stand alone. The work of the Holy Spirit through the individual believer, Calvinism. Calvinism, the Reformed theological positions. All of those. Whoops, let me go back. Okay, so we go back to that initial sheet that we talked about. What does this really mean? Well, it's kind of like we as Baptists, from my perspective, and this is just my opinion, coming out of the Reformation, and next week we'll actually see the beginning of the Baptist movement in England and then over to the United States. They, they, they were able to learn the lessons from all these reformers and say, yes. Yes, yes, and yes, okay? And say, we're going we're gonna to take really what is the best from all of this. Now, I'll give you a personal story. Uh, up until I was 29, I was unchurched. I left the Methodist church when I went off to college. And, uh, you know, I, I'd wander in at Christmas or I'd wander in when there were either uh, lilies or poinsettias uh, in the church. Uh, and it was when I was in my late 20s that some friends of mine said, uh, I was living in Greenville, South Carolina, and they said, hey, Phil, you want to come to church with us? And I went, why not? What church is it? Oh, it's Berea First Baptist. And I went, I've heard about those Baptists, you know. So, but I went anyways. And when I walked out, I was just awestruck with what I called the Christocentric message of the, the sermon. It was about Christ. It was about Christ. It was nothing else. I mean, we sang some songs and had some prayers, whereas in other churches that I had visited, it was other things. It was, it was the Eucharist, or it was, you know, oh, you all are nice, have a great week, and, you know, be nice to other people. But there wasn't any sal salvation message. And I walked out of there and went like, wow. In the words of my grandmother Beulah, who was a staunch Baptist in West Virginia, her words, when I was a kid, just kind of met here, and then the church event here, and I went like, and I made a profession of faith, okay? And, and that's, that's, how it, that's how it happens uh, with many people. But I think this was a, a great time for the, and I think I, yeah, uh, 
I think this was a great opportunity in the middle of the Reformation for, the, for people of God to see kind of what I call the best of the best out of the Reformation and just say, yes, 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 and boom. And the next thing you know, we got the Baptists coming in. So uh, next week, that's what we'll be doing. We'll be uh, looking at uh, next week, wrap up some Reformation, early historical pieces, the Baptist movement. Oop. Okay. Yeah, that's what we'll look at next week. So we're really going to get into the meat of who the Baptists are, how they formed, who were the early Baptists in England, and how they came over to the United States. And this is kind of like we're going to be talking about who we are as individuals. So what are your questions? <laughs> well, you've actually asked a couple different questions here. When you, when you added independent Baptists, that's kind of a different part of the, the larger family of, of Baptists. We'll, we'll pick up on that. Um, when, when you talk about, what was the first part of your question was? Okay. Yeah. In the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about uh, how Baptists kind of in general came to the United States. Uh, and there were what were called uh, particular Baptists, and then there was another group of Baptists, but they got along and then they kind of split off, okay? And then we had the Northern Baptists and the Southern Baptists, and, uh, but your, your question is a good one, and it kind of leads us into the next couple weeks to see how all of these Baptists kind of like different flavors of Baptists, and now they're American Baptists, they're Independent Baptists, and uh, cooperative fellowship Baptists and you know all kinds of Baptists but that's a good question and, and we will address that probably in the next two weeks and you'll get a, a better feel of the uniqueness of who they are and and how they wanted to kind of change things you know and and some of your your question goes back to orthodoxy and orthopraxy you remember those two terms Orthodoxy is correct or right theological beliefs, and orthopraxy is how you practice it. And, and some of these other different Baptist families kind of, you know, I'll, I'll give you one example. One, one flavor of Baptist uh, now ordains uh, uh, homosexuals into the clergy. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm not with you on that, <laughs> you know. But they, they split off, and then some went other directions that, you know, many people said, oh, that isn't right. But, you know, people will do with it. Good question, though. Good question, though. Other questions? I'm sure you have a question. Uh, Mary Lou, that's a, that's a good, good point. Uh, we do belong to the Southern Baptist Convention, and the Southern Baptist Convention, as we'll see in next week and the week after that, uh, is a form of um, cooper cooperation where we can pool money for uh, printing, for overseas missions, uh, for collaboration, so on and so forth. But it's not like the Southern, uh, Southern Baptist Convention can tell us exactly what to do. Because, quite frankly, if you've been in one Baptist church, you've been in one Baptist church. They all run a little bit different, and they all have a little bit different focus. We talked about this when it comes to, like, what do the deacons do? Uh, every Baptist church Carol and I have belonged to, the deacons had some different role. Okay, and the SBC is not going to tell us what to do, but we'll collaborate with them. And, of course, one of the, their uh, mainstay publications is the Baptist Faith and Message. Okay, which is, and we believe in the, uh, we adhere to the 2000 issue, okay, of, the, of that document. Good question. Okay. There, yes, sir. When you're going through the Reformation, did you explain the different elements of it and, and the way they believe? Isn't there a difference in the theological and the doctrine aspect of using? Scripture 
how does that relieve these folks that didn't believe in the pieces of great China they lost? You heard them all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, was there during the Reformation a distinct identification of um, uh, theologically by reading the, the Scripture and, and understanding what it, what it said and how did that translate into the, you know, yeah. Uh, yes, some, uh, some I think more than others, but as you look at whether it was Luther who kicked it off or uh, uh, Calvin or Zwingli or, or whoever, each one had a slightly different perspective. Um, uh, Calvin wrote two huge volumes called The Institutes, which if you would read those, uh, you know, they would blow your mind. I mean, they're so esoteric and so deep, uh, and, and he, you know, point by point by point by point, uh, but that's, that's when you get into issues like predestination, you know, and what does this particular one say? So I think in my, my humble perspective, some did, some greatly did, and some I think kind of missed, missed the mark. So, but, but good question, you know. And, and the church continues to look at theological issues and challenges, and, and one... Uh, uh, is the, the whole notion of the explain to me the Trinity. I mean, that's, you know, and, and there are a lot of different positions on that and understanding. So, good question. Okay. No other questions? Okay. Um, all right. Let's have a prayer. <laughs> Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for continuing to work in the church then and today. Uh, as we walk out of uh, this sanctuary, uh, give us peace, give us understanding, hear us, understand our trials and tribulations, and lead us into those steady waters. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And just for reference, th these things are really warm. They're great in the wintertime, but in the summertime, they are a killer. The what? Baptist Briders, as in Baptist Bride. Mm-mm. They'll have a little rush in. It's just they got to get in here and rehearse for the choir. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha.